Hello and welcome to a new edition of Highlights from the Hill. I'm Jim Cousins and along with Dr. Carol Cavanaugh, our superintendent of schools, we are hosting this show to bring you inside the public school systems here in Hockington to show you all the things we're doing. Today, we're having a conversation with Susan Rothermick, who is the Director of Finances, and we're talking all things budget. So welcome to the show, ladies. Thank you, Thank Jim. You. Uh, I thought bringing Susan here today would be particularly timely in that you know, town meeting is just around the corner for us. Yes. And um, the school department has the biggest portion of the town's budget. And we start building that budget in September, and we are still sort of technically looking at it even today. I mean, we will up until the time that it's voted on on town meeting floor. Yeah. So, and who knows, maybe even after that, we'll be moving some things around as, mm. as needs arise. Um, as many people probably know, Hopkinton is very early in its budget process. So um, there's, you know, obviously pros and cons to that. Um, it's nice to be sort of done so to speak, in yeah. January, um, but it also makes it very hard for us to predict where we'll be in the following year. So um, I'll have Susan just talk a little bit about the budget process, how we begin in September and, and where we are now. Sure, thank you. Um, so the, the budget process, most people don't realize, actually begins in September. Um, so we will meet with the Board of Selectmen, the school committee, and really the, the Board of Selectmen looks at the revenue picture of the town. And from that, they devise what can be afforded um, for all town departments uh, to, for the next fiscal year, looking at long-term projections. And so they give us what they call their budget guidance. Mm -hmm. In other words, this is what we believe, based on estimated revenues, we can afford to allocate to each department. So the school department gets that percentage, or that number, if you will, in September. And we take that back. Um, with the school committee and then we also go and give the um, the building principals and all of the um, divisions if you will special education building and grounds kind of their guidance of you know look at your facility look at your kids look at the kids that you project to have in front of you and really build from the bottom up you know speak with your teachers speak with your um, subject matter leaders and really determine what is needed for that next school year. So this is all happening a year in advance of those students walking in the door for the next fiscal year. So it is a very long process. Um, a lot of people, you know, very poignant for this community, discuss the, um, the budget as being a marathon as opposed to a sprint mm -hmm. um, because it, it is such a long process. So over the fall months, the uh, buildings will be building their budget based on the information that they get from, um, from their district, from their kids, from the SMLs. And so it, it, it is a bottom-up, zero-based budget every, every year. You know, we start from scratch. And then that budget is brought to the central office and the administration, and they present to, to us. They meaning the principals? They meaning the principals. Okay. Uh, sorry. And they'll discuss what the needs are. Mm -hmm. And so that becomes kind of the very beginning of the process. And at that point in time, I believe we had an increase of about 9.9% .9 overall with uh, all the um, divisions coming and okay. looking at, you know, bottom up what yep. they needed for their departments. And that includes things such as equipment, uh, small things, even furniture to put in classrooms because of the number of kids that are, that are coming in. Um, and, you know, staffing needs, you know, the, the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, so when you go to the schools, you just say, this is number X, and then each principal working amongst their school comes up with everything underneath that? They sort of do. Okay. So, I mean, it, in some ways, we could refer to it as a wish list, mm -hmm. except that it's not really wishes. I mean, we have children in front of us who have real needs. So principals put everything on the list that they believe they will need to run their buildings in FY20, for example. Okay. And um, then what will happen is we'll take a look at that percentage and see if it matches what we got as our guidance from the Board of Selectmen. Okay. So this year, our guidance from the Board of Selectmen was 6.5%, and our original budget came in at... 
9.9%. Nine. 9 9 <laughs> so you can see that there's you know, a great big discrepancy. And when we need to really cut out about 3.5%, mm -hmm. um, we're talking about, is it about a million two that we had to reduce yeah. by? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, from that sort of wish list, right? I see. So what is it that we absolutely positively need to run our schools yeah. becomes the question. Right. And we have people who run technology, special education, um, curriculum, as well as the building principals and the SMLs, subject matter leaders who are making those choices. Mm -hmm. And they are hard choices. Yeah. That's it. I think the bottom up um, philosophy sounds really interesting because it's, it's like you're looking at everything new every single year, not just because we had this last year. Is it still, you know, uh, a critical need in the upcoming year? Yes. It's an interesting, yeah. interesting way of looking at it. I mean, the one thing that you always want to get away from is, well, this is how we've always done it. Mm -hmm. So you need to re-examine that on an annual basis um, because how we've always done it, one, we may not be able to afford it, and two, it may not be relevant anymore. Mm -hmm. So it makes a difference. Right. So if I could just follow up with one thing that, that you both said was interesting was it starts in September and it's kind of early. Um, how early is it compared to, I don't know, maybe other systems that are starting theirs? Uh, you know, it is it is actually a little bit typical. Mm -hmm. It's early in that we, the school committee, will have their public hearing and pass their budget in January. What makes it early, again, is we're starting a process in September, which is a year before you see those students. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, some districts will push out their their um, actual passing of the budget mm -hmm. to get more information from the state in terms of the budget numbers, the revenue coming in from the state. Yeah. Um, so when that becomes extremely important, you can see that budget getting pushed off a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. And isn't it in our system where there's a lot of growth that's been happening? Uh, isn't that very impactful <laughs> all the way through? It's very impactful. So we, last year when we were creating the budget for FY19, we assumed that uh, the influx of students, the increase in enrollment, for example, would be similar to what it has been in years past. So we estimated somewhere around 50 students. By the time we got into October of this past school year, so October of 2018, there were 189 new students sitting in front of us. Wow. So, yeah, when you're accounting for 139 additional kids, and what I always say is every 20 kids is about 1.4 teachers. Okay. So, you know, you've got seven groups of 20 if yep. you're going up to 140, so I needed seven times 1.4 teachers. And that caused us a lot of grief, I think. In mm -hmm. the fall, we were creating new teams in the middle school, which was very, very difficult for families. So if you had a child, for example, who had been on Team X, and because of the reconfiguration, we had to move that particular student away from the teachers that they already knew and put them on a new team, it was very, very difficult for kids. Yeah. Right? Um, it was a little easier to do at the high school level because when we added teachers at the high school level, we added the mid-year. And you know that at the semester change, kids' schedules change just naturally. Yeah. So, Every kid could have had a chance of getting a new math teacher or a new English teacher at that point in time. So many of them did because we had math sections that were exceeding 30. You know, some teachers who had 150 kids on their, um, you know, student roster, yeah. if you will. And, and I just feel like that's obviously way too many kids to be, you know, effective in our in our instruction and effective in student learning. Right. So it's challenging. All right. Well, sorry, but for that diversion, no, it's very it interesting. Was a good one. Um, if you want to continue on with like the next step in the, the budget process. Sure. So as I said, the school committee will pass their budget in, in January, and we pass it on to um, the, the uh, town manager, who then folds it in with all the other departments. Mm -hmm. So our guidance was 6.5%. And as I said, we started at 9, 9.9. .9. We got down to a little over 6.6. .6. So we mm -hmm. got close to yeah. the guidance. We didn't get all the way there. Um, and it was a lot of conversations and very difficult decisions to get from that original, what the buildings believe they needed, mm -hmm. down to follow that guidance. You know, understanding that, you know, revenues are finite. Um, so we did the best, the best we could. So 
then it became the process from the town perspective of taking our budget and folding it in with all the other departments because every department has needs. Not only would uh, the growth affect the schools, it affects every department. Right. Um, now that was a very succinct description of it, but I have to imagine that going from 9.9 .9 to 6.6 .6 was a lot more difficult it was very than difficult. just the way you described oh, it. Are there right. any highlights going through this, this year's process? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, we did have a couple of meetings at Central Office where, in a very small conference room, we put the two of us, Jen Parson, the assistant superintendent, and the five building principals, and all the budgets were on the table. And the charge was, we've got to get this thing reduced by about a million dollars. Let's start to think about where we can make those cuts. And as you can imagine, every building principal is very protective of their kids, their faculty, their building needs. And I mean, in a crazy way, we kind of sweat them out, mm -hmm. right? Like we, we keep them in there until we see enough dollars on for one day. And then we say, we'll come back and do this again next week. Uh, but what ends up happening, I think, is we say, okay, so you have a full-time school adjustment counselor. You're asking for a school adjustment counselor. What if you went to 0.5 and you gave the other 0.5 to this particular principal? Or we just had um, a sort of a, a teacher who had resigned in December, for example, right? And she was a 0.5 special educator in one of our elementary schools. And we said, well, we've been living without one for a while now. We took her caseload and redistributed it to other special educators. So could we live without this position? And piece by piece, we whittle it down. So we might say to the high school principal, you have two asks. One is a special educator, one is a guidance counselor. Which one do you believe you can live without, mm -hmm. right? Or, and, and it becomes sometimes a Band-Aid you know, on that jugular vein, mm. like we're going to hold it together for one more year. Um, and I guess thinking about next year is important right now. One of the things that I will share with the community on town meeting floor is our projection for student enrollment next year. We get student enrollment projections from NESDAQ. They've done that for our community for years. But we also have data that comes to us now from the planning board, you know, when our home's going to be closed. And we've even reached out to the person who does Welcome Wagon in our community because she's seeing sort of firsthand who's buying homes that are turning over, who's, you know, inhabiting new construction, and, and we get a good picture of the kids who are coming in. Mm -hmm. Anyway, our projection for next year was 103 students. Currently, we have about 35 students who are already formally enrolled. They okay. are in our, our buildings right now, yep. getting taught by our teachers. We have um, about another 30 who have already gone into our electronic system IPASS mm -hmm. and have begun the registration process. So right now we're about 34 kids away from that 103. Okay. I think it's a dangerous number. And Susan can add, you know, how many kids came to us just last summer alone. Mm. I mean, typically your big enrollment happens in that period between June 15th and August 15th. Yeah. We haven't gotten to that place yet, and we have 30 sort of technically slots left, if you will, based on that 103. Right. So I'm, I don't want to be the mistress of doom and gloom, but I'm <laughs> predicting big enrollment numbers again. The mistress of reality. The mistress <laughs> of reality is what I'm trying to be right. here. Right. So this, yeah. is planning board where you get information on, like, housing starts and like developments that are being coming online, mm -hmm. that that's where that kind of information comes in? Pretty much, yes. Yeah, yeah and we use that not only for um, the enrollment for the students, but also planning the bus routes. Mm -hmm. So that becomes extremely important. Um, you know, when you talk about decisions for the budget, we had originally put in for two more buses, and one of the decisions was to kind of roll the dice and only put in one more bus. Mm -hmm. And that may be difficult. Um, one of the things that I know people in the community do see is you don't need a bus because that bus is empty. Mm -hmm. um, but what we struggle with is the timing between the schools is only about 30 minutes. So it's a mixture between getting the kids on and off the bus, the getting through town, yeah. all over town, with the traffic, the number of stops, and getting back in 30 minutes. Some buses, just by the geography they cover, mm -hmm. do not have, are not filled to capacity because because they can't. Right. Some buses are filled to capacity, and empty those kids in three stops mm -hmm. in 15 minutes. Yeah. So so these are the struggles that we have. Um, but part of the the housing starts is we need to plan also for the fact that 
if we have a bus stop here and we know that there will be at least you know a significant number of new housing starts mm -hmm. we have to leave room on that bus right you know as we're planning the routes because we're doing the routes now yeah mm -hmm. um so again we're we're somewhat doing the routes also blind mm. we build the budget a little bit blind we're building the bus routes blind um you know That's these are the constraints so interesting. and you're thinking about next year's bus routes in september is that we part are. of that we budget? do we have because we have to think about the number yes. of kids wow yeah and where they'll be. That's one of the hidden things I think about the budget. So I, I believe that most people, when they think about budget, they think about how many teachers, how many textbooks, yep. how many chairs, how many desks, right? Those, there's a, a particular logic to that thinking. But you know, when you are feeding 500 kids in a cafeteria, for example, we even have to think about the cost and the size of the oven. How many meals can that oven put out, mm -hmm. right? How many buses do we need to pick up kids? And a bus is about $70,000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah to yeah. run a single bus through town. So when you add you know, two buses, we're talking $140,000, $150,000, right? right? That's right. a significant amount of money. And when you look at a single school bus, it's also the price of a math teacher. Yeah. Right? So you're weighing a lot of, of things. Right. right. All right, so now we're at the point where all of the, the sweating has, has happened to bring the budget down to 6.6. .6. What month was that in? In January. In January, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Smooth sailing from there, I assume. No, actually <laughs> not. <laughs> because again, we're only a piece to the town. Yeah. So as all the departments were folded into one budget and then it was presented um, to the Board of Selectmen, they actually still wanted that number to come down. So uh, um, the town manager did come back to each of the departments and ask us to find more. Mm -hmm. um, you know. And there's also, there's the other piece to the budget, which is also the capital plan. So we, you know, each department has their needs in terms of capital replacement as well. So it's not only a game with the operating budget, but it's also a game with the capital plan. So yeah. what can we do? What can we live without? What can we do to bring these numbers on both sides of that equation down even further mm -hmm. so that the Board of Selectmen is comfortable to present that to the taxpayers? Okay. So no, there were additional cuts even beyond that January okay. um, that we had to bring back to the school committee for acceptance as well. Yes, and maybe what people also don't know is that there is actually a 10-year capital plan. So we plan for what will it look like when you need to replace a boiler, right, for example, or a roof, for example. Yeah. Um, so those pieces are out there, and part of me worries a little bit that because it's not a teacher or a textbook or a desk or a chair, the things that you need every single day, we have a tendency to put those things on back burners, yeah. right? And you know, you can speak to the effect of that over time. Right. I mean, the the infrastructure is extremely important. Obviously, mm -hmm. um, if your heat goes down or if and you know something in the kitchen goes down, right. you're unable to operate. And and you you have a teacher, and then you have the heat. So yeah. these are all equally important. Um, so that the. the the infrastructure and the capital plan becomes extremely important to mm -hmm. make sure that you are paying attention, doing your cyclical replacements, doing your preventive maintenance to keep all things moving in the same direction. The worst thing you can do is ignore your building. Right. Um, yeah. So I think deferred maintenance comes up a lot, I would assume, that term. Deferred maintenance, we really are... Um, getting there there yep. there has in and, and and it's very typical of school systems because they're you know again the the dollars are finite a lot of times that is what gets pushed back yeah um so i i do see that yeah. and i am trying to resuscitate that and get us back onto onto track there are some things that have been um put back and deferred Okay. you know in favor of obviously making the budget work right but there there are breaking points and so th some things have to be addressed okay so more in the sweat room Get, gets it down <laughs> from 6.6 .6. we got to 6.6 .6. yep and and that was when we could all stop sweating okay right. and i thought we're you know a tenth of a percent or whatever away so we we could all uh kind of move forward with that and you know 
I'll be honest, no one comes out of the sweat room feeling good, mm -hmm. right? I mean, right. everyone feels like there was something that they needed that they didn't walk away with. And so when, you know, when we're asked to take 6.6 .6 and reduce it even further, I mean, in some ways, that's why you go to the capital budget, because mm -hmm. I don't think that there's anything else we can eke out of the principals. You know, I mean, yeah. I think at that point they are emotionally drained. Um, so, you know, they move on and, you know, we'll start school in September and, and things will be okay and we'll make do exactly with what we have. Um, unless, of course, we have, you know, another, th like this year when we got our 189 kids, 30 of them, for example, were sixth graders. Okay. If our 103 kids are sort of evenly dispersed yeah. throughout the grade levels, we're going to be fine. Yeah. You know, I mean, even if you get to 110 kids, you're going to be fine. It will be a problem if you have 37th graders or, you know, yeah. a whole group of sophomores that start filling up, you know, math classes and English language arts classes, then, then we'll have a problem we have to deal with. Um, some good news uh, in terms of our, our physical plans is we have submitted a statement of interest to the Mass School Building Authority to do a renovation and rebuild on the Elmwood site. Mm -hmm. So it would be very nice to make that school give it sort of the facelift that it needs, but also you know create space that is direly needed. Right. Um, That's our oldest school now, right? Yes. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. was six point six the floor, or after the selectmen said, "Oh, we want a little bit more," did it ever has it gone below that? We were at six point six nine. Okay. We are at six point six three. Oh, I see. Okay. But we also did move around within our capital plan as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah. So quickly before we wrap up, tell a little bit about some of the state monies that come in over the summer because those things are never quite something that you can count on. So, in terms of grants. Sure, grants or. Yeah. Uh, so you yeah, know, a big piece of what we operate on in addition to what comes from the town is we have our grant funds and also what we consider revolving funds as, as a, for instance. These are things that also supplement the budget, um, which people don't necessarily realize, although parents certainly do realize because they have to pay sports fees, they have to pay bus fees. All of that money is also in addition to our budget in order to actually make it work. Mm -hmm. So that's in addition to the town appropriation. Um, in order to get rid of any fees, you know, in which parent would make parents extremely happy, we would need the other side, the revenue side on the town to be a, to, to right. grow. Um, but in addition, we get grants for special education, um, Title I, which comes and goes because that's based on poverty. Mm -hmm. So two years ago, we did not have that. This year we did, and it's already looking as though we will not have it again. Um, so it's those fifty thousand dollars, yeah. just to put a price tag on it. Yeah. So that those are some of the things, the uncertainty of whether or not you can actually run some of these programs um, it is dependent on the grants and whether you qualify for them again. I see. So, yeah. Yeah. And you were just talking about parents and how much uh, they contribute to public education, mm -hmm. and you know we all talk about free and appropriate public education, but essentially. It's really not free when you think about how many dollars parents are spending. So we had recently asked all of the building principals to go into a spreadsheet and put in all of those things that we sort of asked parents to pay for, like field trips or, you know, books or, you know, things like the prom or, you know, what, yeah. whatever it might be, right? And when we looked at that bus fees, I mean, Parents are paying literally thousands of dollars per child to get their student from K to 12 in the Hopkinton Public Schools. It's very costly to send your, you know, out-of-pocket expense to send your child clubs, sports, mm -hmm. all of those fees, right? And you're a parent, you, you know. Yeah. Um, but th it's, it's an enormous amount of money. And our per-pupil expenditure in our district is about $14,500 per kid. And I think if parents were to look at some of the state statistics, you'd realize that Hopkinton's per pupil expenditure is actually quite low. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. yeah, I've seen those charts. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and for the value, you know, the the ranking in education for Hopkinton, you know, and then the per pupil, right. uh, you know, you talk about the bang for the buck. It's, it's amazing. extremely high. Yes. Yeah, yeah, huh. and I so. think I would just want people to be very cautious about, you know, their thinking about. You know, the money that we put into our schools and, you know, the benefits that we reap from them, because yeah. I think that we just have to be very careful 
because as your per pupil expenditure gets lower and lower, sometimes so too do your services to kids, right? Yeah. So just something to think about. Okay. Mm. So now, now you're done. You went through the selectmen and brought mm -hmm. it down a little bit more. Now we breathe a sigh of relief. Everybody's ready to go. Well, now comes town meeting. Yeah. Uh, so town meeting will vote not only the budget but also the capital plan. Okay. So it's very important for people to pay attention, uh, attend town meeting, and you know, be thoughtful on on what they're voting. Um, uh, you know, again, the capital plan is extremely important to keep and maintain your buildings. Right. This is Rothermick and I have a wonderful presentation we'll be doing on town meeting floor so that anyone who wants to see any more of the particulars about where the money goes, mm -hmm. they can see that and be informed voters at town meeting. Excellent. Mm. Um, yeah, that, I would think that would be a pretty big presentation because it's a lot of moving parts in, in the school system. Yes. What is our budget number? Uh, 48, 48 million for the operating budget. Yes. Okay. It's yeah. an awful lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so uh, is that presentation going to be available on, on your website at some point? It probably will be right after. Yeah. So w one of the things that also happens through the budget season is we continue every time the school committee meets, we do a budget update. Mm -hmm. Every one of those PowerPoint presentations, you know, is uploaded to the website, you know, at the yes. appropriate time. So people mm -hmm. can follow along at home. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for having us. I just felt like this was a really good opportunity for us to you know, sort of get more information about how the budget's built, where the money comes from, what it's used for, what the process looks like. And so it was a pleasure to be here today, Jim. It was thank fantastic. It's very informational, especially the, the time that is spent, you know, and hearing about the sweat room. I never heard about that. <laughs> I always wondered how you it's get down there. It's <laughs> reality. Okay. All right. Thank you again. And thank you for... Um, your viewership to Highlights from the Hill. We hope you tune in to another show soon. Hello, my name is Officer John Corden of the Hopkinton Police Department. I'm here to explain some important information regarding opiate overdoses under the Good Samaritan Law, Chapter 94C, Section 34A. First, a person who in good faith seeks medical assistance for someone experiencing a drug-related overdose shall not be charged or prosecuted for possession of a controlled substance. Second, a person who experiences a drug-related overdose and in good faith either seeks medical assistance or other seeking assistance shall not be charged or prosecuted for possession of a controlled substance. Third, the act of seeking medical assistance for someone who is experiencing a drug-related overdose may be used as a mitigating factor in a criminal prosecution under the Controlled Substance Act. Lastly, a person acting in good faith may receive a Narcan prescription and administer it to an individual appearing to be experiencing an opiate-related overdose. For more information, please contact the Hopkinton Police Department or Denise Hildreth, Director of Youth and Family Services. Thank you.